Hello. Almost every time socialism is discussed, some flaw, which in my experience is usually a misconception, if not outright projection, will be brought up that something makes socialism unworkable. I'm here to clear up these misconceptions. One of the most common things that we hear is that supposedly there is no capacity for innovation under socialism. In order to clear up this misconception, we need to explain how many of the innovations we use today came about. Your blank was made by capitalism is a strange phrase that doesn't make much sense under further scrutiny. First of all, capitalism, socialism, or any other isms don't make anything. Workers make everything. Isms just determine who gets paid in the end. Those isms basically reflect how working people relate to means of production, and how they are remunerated for their work. I made a deeper dive on one video that explains all this here. Under capitalism, the driving force for investment in the development of technology is profit. If it's profitable, capitalists will fund it. If it's not profitable, even if it were to save millions of lives or the climate an ever-pressing issue, it wouldn't get funded. If it won't make some shareholders somewhere richer, forget about it. Under socialism, on the other hand, the driving factors for development of new technologies, techniques, medicines, or whatever else are human need and human creativity, rather than profits. Of course, some sort of social surplus has to be accounted for, but that can be accommodated without profit-seeking. I cover this more clearly in this video here, but I'm keeping things simple for now. Let's just think for a second, though. Let me ask you this, how many Newtons, Ghazalis, and Einsteins has humanity lost in sweatshops, on cotton fields, or in cobalt mines? How many due to systemic imperialism draining the third world of resources and keeping them poor? How much human potential was locked behind United Fruit Company plantations and Sri Lankan tea farms? Under capitalism, higher education, a necessary prerequisite to innovation and development, is locked behind very, very expensive tuition fees and other expenses of universities. That is, if people are even literate in the first place and have completed lower forms of education. Currently, hundreds of millions are illiterate, and many on top of that, even in supposedly highly developed countries, are functionally illiterate and are unable to contribute to their communities as a result. 30% of the world's population haven't even completed lower secondary school education, a level that has been stagnant since the early 2000s. Even in countries with free education, old systemic inequalities still play negative roles, albeit to a lower extent than, for example, in the US. Under socialism, all stages of education, from pre-K to postgraduate education, are absolutely free. That's why even some of the poorest countries on Earth reach literacy and university completion levels similar to those of far wealthier capitalist countries. And for a deeper dive, I suggest you check out these videos here. Currently, only 6.5% of the world's adult population has a college degree, and the majority of them only do because they are financially capable of acquiring one or lived in a country where universities were actually available and free to access. This means that up to 94% of human intellectual, scientific, and innovative capacity is being left unharvested by a global capitalist system that only grants higher educational development to an elite few. Capitalism, in reality, actually stifles useful innovation. US pharmaceutical companies do virtually no research aimed at developing new drugs to cure diseases such as tuberculosis and malaria, for the most part, which kill tens of millions of low-income people every single year in the third world. They instead fund research on new remedies for acne or toenail fungus, which can be sold to high-income consumers in wealthier markets. Even when massive outbreaks occur, unless there is massive financial incentive, along with state and tax subsidies, nothing happens. That's not even commenting on parallel development by two firms of the same or similar technology, wasting twice as many resources so that one reaches the market as quickly as possible, even through dubious means if necessary. Whatever innovation is done, it's used for profit rather than for human need. As an example, Pfizer's patented drug fluconazole, which cures cryptococcal meningitis, a deadly side effect of AIDS, sells for $18 a pill, placing it beyond the reach of AIDS sufferers in Southern Africa, for example. A generic version, produced in Thailand, however, outside the reach of Pfizer's patent, costs 60 cents a pill. The patent has expired since, and generics have become more frequent as a result, but I already hear someone saying, if they didn't patent it and charge a premium, regardless of the ethics, it would deter research in the future as they wouldn't be able to secure a return on investment. That would be a sound argument if these major pharmaceutical companies didn't receive massive tax breaks and government funding from much of what they develop. That's not even mentioning how many taxes they dodge. COVID vaccines were a perfect, but far from the only, example. For a further dive into how you basically have already paid twice for everything through state funding, take a look at this video here. Back to the video in just a second. Let's hear from today's sponsor, Guardio. Guardio is a browser extension which helps you protect yourself as you browse online on all your devices. Plenty of people save sensitive data directly on their browsers, including banking information and passwords. 
This is an attractive opportunity for scammers to try to gain control of your system, but that won't happen with Guardio. Guardio acts as the first line of defense, detecting threats before they reach your browser and cause harm, unlike more traditional solutions that only get to work once the threat has already infected your system. After installing Guardio, a free security scan will detect any existing threats found on your browser, and with a free 7-day trial, you can remove any threats and enable real-time protection for your peace of mind. Phishing protection, blocking of harmful sites, malicious extensions that steal credentials, adware, malware, hijacker protection, and much more is available with Guardio. Protect yourself and up to 5 family members under a single account. Avoid installing malware or falling victim to scams and get active real-time alerts when your information could be at risk. So what are you waiting for? Click my link in the description to start your 7 day free trial as well as get 20% off Guardio Premium. No charge during the free trial, no commitment, and a 30 day money back guarantee. Guardio blocks 100 times more harmful websites and 10 times more malicious downloads than any competitor. Get Guardio now and protect your online browsing and information. Avoid installing malware and falling victim to scams and get real time alerts when your information could be at risk. So if you want a clean and secure browsing experience, click my link in the description and check out their affordable premium plan for full protection. Big thanks to Guardia for the sponsorship, this is what allows me to pay my editor fairly so the support is very appreciated. Alright, back to the video. Let's entertain the idea though. If something truly was made by capitalism, then it surely must have been funded by capitalists and been from the private sector, right? Surprisingly, the majority, I dare say even all of the things we've become so close with, came out of government funded public sector projects, not the private sector. Funding came from either the public, from civilian government institutions, or from the military. To give examples of things that came out of government funding overall, touchscreens were developed by government enterprises in Britain and by CERN, GPS and the Soviet equivalent GLONASS were developed by the militaries of the US and the USSR respectively, microchips were also a government project, image sensors, accelerometers, satellites, the internet, barcodes, radar vaccines, green energy sources, even all the background work for Google was done through government funding. Mariana Mazzucato from the University of Sussex states that every major technological change in recent years traces most of its funding back to the state. Even early state private sector venture capitalists come in much, much later, after the big breakthroughs have been made. Adding on to this, a recent article from the Scientific American stated that without government support, most basic scientific research will never happen. It's evidently clear that it isn't capitalism we can thank for these innovations, it is public funding, the type that is massively bolstered and supported under socialism. In fact, innovation has happened not due to capitalism necessarily, and in many instances has happened in spite of it. Short of the early history of capitalism in which relentless expansion of the productive forces and their efficiency, including the overworking of men, women, and children, forced a cynical development of technology. Now instead, we get nonsense like the Juicero, or yet another gig economy app for people to slave away at for less than minimum wage. To consider capitalism as the source of humanity's recent great achievements is silly to say the least. Intelligent people, working very hard, with a state behind them that provides them with the funds, equipment, education, and facilities they need are what we should thank. Under socialism, massive public projects for this sort of great innovation aren't only possible, it's already happened before. For science, socialism is what will lead the road ahead. On an interesting side note though, a lot of innovation did happen under socialism, contrary to the usual nonsense you hear. Satellites, LEDs, the first nuclear power plant in Obninsk, some of the first antibiotics, interlaced video, methods for preventing the transfer of HIV from mother to child, cadaveric blood transfusion, laser eye surgery, the electric rocket motor used for spacecraft to this day, space stations, lung cancer vaccines, even the first mobile phone and much more were all invented or done in socialist countries. Imagine a world where innovation is the enjoyment of all of humanity rather than a select few in half a dozen countries. Imagine a world where education is treated like the human right it intrinsically is, and where everyone has access to free, high quality education at all levels. Imagine a world where your community's needs and your personal creativity are what drive innovations and not the need to turn a profit for some middle management asshat named Kyle. Imagine a world where we have true democracy, economic democracy. Imagine socialism, that conveniently for us has already been tried and tested. If you're of the thinking that socialism failed as a response to my little comment, we'll take a look at this video here. That's all well and good though, but things can be even better. Not only can the full potential of human ingenuity be unlocked through widespread educational policies, but also I'm sure you've heard of automation. Far from being a vision of some sci-fi future, it's actually a meaningful possibility within our lifetimes. Within the next few decades, you math will see robots and machines slowly become a larger and larger part of production, cutting working hours and prices down and increasing productivity. That's all good, no? So why is it such a controversial topic? First of all, what is automation? In the most basic definition, it's the introduction of a machine that will do labor that previously acquired a human being. All the complex drilling, lifting, cutting, manipulating, putting together, and much more that used to take anywhere from one worker to a hundred workers, now requires just a set of machines finely tuned doing what needs to be done perfectly. The hurdle, though, as is commonplace nowadays, is capitalism. Let me explain. A capitalist will automate a factory, and through doing this he will see productivity rise and his long-term costs go down. As he will fire, the workers now made redundant due to the introduction of these new machines. 
These workers that have now become a liability for the capitalist are let go, as the capitalist has no need to pay wages, provide paid maternity leave, vacation time, sick days, etc., since robots don't get pregnant or need vacations. The sheer amount of jobs that will be lost due to automation is staggering. Truck drivers, who occupy millions of jobs in the United States alone, will all lose their employment due to the advent of self-driving cars. Cashiers, clerks, receptionists, and anyone working behind a stand or counter of any sort will lose their jobs to computers. Even more highly intricate or technically involved jobs can face certain threats from this development. This eventually spells a problem for capitalism, that the capitalists don't foresee. They're known for their lack of foresight, after all. That's actually incorrect. They do foresee it, they just don't care. These capitalists that now produce much more for much less because of automation won't actually be able to sell their products. All these out-of-job workers won't have the money to buy any of these products that capitalists are turning out, and voila, one of the many contradictions of capitalism unfolds. Some may say that a universal basic income is the solution to this crisis, but I've already made a video regarding this point that you can view here. Regardless, think about that for a second. Automation, such a beautiful, amazing thing, is rendered not only frightening but downright destructive because of the inherent nature of capitalism. That's not even mentioning the misanthropic sense of the system, which would sooner keep you working 8, 10, or 12 hours, increasing your working day, if they can get away with it, even with skyrocketing productivity as a result of further automation and improvements in production. Just as the real wage versus productivity curve since the 70s, by the way. But what if there was an alternative? Rather than having machines put large swaths of the population out of work due to the anarchy of capitalism in the market, under socialism these machines would be used as intended, to reduce the amount of work we all need to do without dropping people from the workforce as a planned restructuring of production can take place, opening up new avenues for employing those whose work has become automated. Rather than working 8, 10, 12 hour days, people can work 2, 3 or 4 hour days and have automation pick up the productivity slack. Lower running costs long term and better humane outcomes for those that make up any socioeconomic system to begin with. Under socialism, regular working people like you and I will control the implementation of automation, unlike under capitalism, where capital does. Automation will be made to serve the interests of humanity rather than profit. Eventually, with automation becoming near universal, human beings will be freed from work in its more convenient and tedious forms. A possible future is that instead of being an appendage of the machine, human beings would now have the work of designing and maintaining machines instead, a form of work that is much more versatile and requires education and creativity, along with other administrative and technical work. On top of this, human beings will be able to devote time to their own creative development, allowing for everyone to maximize their creative potential for creation of art or invention or entertainment. The key to our own liberation lays in our hands, but the Bezoses and Pelosi's of the world wouldn't like you knowing that. That's all for this time. If you enjoy what I do, then please consider supporting me on Patreon. It really does help. I'd like to thank my patrons, so thank you too. Ned Wanda, Mike, Peter Lewis, Emil Vakitov, Isaac Anke, Savo, Felix Paulson, Amin Nishad, Abdurrahman, and Amit Berge.